Very cool. Um, cool. Well, welcome everyone. Um, well, I'm going to get started and we'll see if, if, uh, if more people join us as, as the night goes on. Um, thanks everyone for, for coming. Hi. Um, I'm sorry, more people coming. Here we go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brian Gresko. Uh, welcome to The Antibody, which is a quarantine reading series, part of Lit Hub's virtual book channel. Uh, and I'm coming to you like I do every week from my writing studio in Brooklyn, uh, three blocks from the Barclays Center. And on, uh, on Friday, May 29th, um, I joined the protest there. I felt, I felt, felt it important, felt, felt the need felt driven to, to, to add my, um, my privileged body, my privileged voice to the crowd that had come together to say Black Lives Matter. Um, and in those, I guess, 12 days, maybe since it's since then, I have marched, I've protested, um, I've been out on the streets um, almost every day uh, recording both conflict, um, but also just um, amazing acts of, of human kindness and outpourings of emotion. Um, and I've been, I've been reminded um, very clearly every day that the work that I must do as a white male of being anti-racist needs to be ongoing. Uh, last week, the antibody went off the air in solidarity with Blackout Tuesday. Um, this week we're back and I'm glad for this, uh, this thoughtful space and the positive energy and um, the human connection that's created when we gather, in this case, around our screens to bear witness to the human experience via the human voice. Um, I see a few friends in the crowd and I, I know that um, if you know me, you know I'm not religious, uh, but this kind of coming together is something I feel very, very deeply. Um, so, so thank you for, for being a part of it. Um, and tonight we have a trio of fantastic authors who I'm really excited to hear. Uh, Shayla Lawson is here, Nadia Owusu is here, and Emily Rabito is here. Um, and I'm grateful for them and for you too. So as I do every week, I will ask to just uh, join me in just taking a, a nice deep breath and just settling your body in um, as, as we um, take in their artistry. Um, if you are new here, here's how it works. You came in with your mics on mute. I ask that you please keep them that way. Towards the end of the, the uh, event, we'll have some time for a Q and A, um, but we don't have a stage, um, but we do have a microphone. And so I ask that you please honor the authors when they have the microphone as each author is gonna read to us for a little bit. Um, the chat, though, is public, um, so please show your appreciation for the authors, um, because that's awesome and, and always a good thing to show the love. Uh, and so please, if you could get your keys clicking and your fingers tapping to welcome our first author, Nadia Owosu. Nadia mm -hmm. is a Brooklyn-based writer and urban planner. Uh, Simon & Schuster will publish her first book, Aftershocks, in 2021. Her lyric essay chapbook, So Devilish a Fire, is a winner of the Atlas Review chapbook series and was published in 2018. Her writing has appeared or is forthcoming in the New York Times, the Literary Review, Catapult, and other places. Nadia grew up in Rome, Addis Ababa, Kampala, <laughs> Dar es Salaam, Kumasi, and London. Um, but now she's in Brooklyn and she is a associate director at Living Cities, an economic racial justice organization. Um, wow, I'm so excited to hear you read. Please welcome Nadia. Hi, Nadia. Hi, hi, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to yeah. be here uh, and to meet Shayla and Emily and thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'm gonna read the first essay in my memoir, Aftershocks. Um, the essay is called First Earthquake. Rome, Italy, age seven. My mother's hair is long, straight, and black. It blows behind her in the wind. She's walking away again. In the moonlight, she is a phantom ship drifting out on obsidian waters toward the place where the sky and ocean meet disappearing over the curvature of the earth. And the moment is so evanescent, so intangible that I am already wondering a wisp of her still in sight if she was ever there at all. She does not turn to see me in the doorway. 
I am seven years old, bundled up in a pink sweater and down stuffed coat, my bobbled hat pulled down past my eyebrows. My white socks are dingy and damp from the rain that seeped into the black canvas shoes I insist on wearing no matter the weather. I want to call out to her, but I'm afraid she will not turn around. Or worse, that she will, but still won't choose me. She gets into the passenger seat of the blue Fiat her husband borrowed from an acquaintance. They are passing through Rome for a day on their way back to Massachusetts. They vacationed in Venice. That morning before my mother arrives without sign or signal, I wake up to the sound of rain. It is dark outside, so dark that I think it might still be night until I smell pancakes. My father makes pancakes on Saturday mornings. As I eat my breakfast, face buried in a shabby copy of Little Women, my father frets. He taps his foot, peeps at his watch, pushes his glasses up the bridge of his nose. I wonder what's making him anxious and hope that whatever it is doesn't require him to sit at his desk all weekend. He just got back from a work trip to Dhaka. I want him to myself. The radio always perched on the kitchen counter next to the toaster, its bent antenna somehow finding the BBC World Service brings news of a catastrophic earthquake in Armenia. Tens of thousands of people have been killed. Hundreds of thousands have lost their homes and everything in them. A city called Spitak has been destroyed. A new city, the woman on the radio says, will have to be built over the ruins. Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev asks the world for help. On my pancake, I spread butter and sprinkle sugar. Does mama have family in Armenia? My father flinches and looks at me with eye wide eyes magnified by Coke bottle glasses. No, he says, her family are Armenian, but they lived in Turkey. They're all in America now. We usually avoid the topic of my mother, but the BBC says this is an emergency. Rules are suspended in emergencies. I am half Armenian, but I'm not sure if the earthquake has anything to do with me. My Ghanaian father, stepmother Annabelle, sister Yasmin and I live in Italy. This is the first I've heard of the Caucasus Mountains, the fault rupture point that caused the event. I ask my father what an aftershock is. He says they are tremors in the earth that follow an earthquake. They are the earth's delayed reaction to stress. The doorbell rings just as I'm about to go upstairs to brush my teeth. Yasmin, who has stumbled into the kitchen rubbing her eyes, jolts awake and scampers after me to see who it is. We hope our friends from next door have come to play. Our mother is on the front porch with two red balloons and shaking hands. Frozen, I stare at her. Remembering my voice, I shout for my father to come. We haven't seen my mother in three years, not since I was four. My father nods hello and sends Yasmin and me to get dressed. When we come downstairs, my parents are still standing in the hallway. They're not speaking. My mother's hands are in her pockets. She has let go of the red balloons and they had floated up to the ceiling. Her head drops. My father's shoulders are drawn back, his legs spread apart. Your mother is going to take you for a drive. My father opens the closet and pulls out our puppy coats. I can feel him on the other side of the front door when he closes it behind us, as though to say he will be there exactly where we left him when we return. My mother's husband drives silent while my mother chatters. Our half sisters are dying to see us. She will bring them next time. Venice is a magical place. She can hardly believe it's real. Our grandparents bought us a kite in the shape of a fish. Our father can show us how to fly it in the spring. Despite the drizzle, my mother's husband drops us off in Piazza Navona. An artist draws a funny sketch of us together with bulbous heads and startled eyes. We eat at a cafe, plates of spaghetti al pomodoro. All of us request lots of Parmesan cheese. My mother asks about school and says our house is beautiful, even though, as far as I know, she has only seen the hallway. I ask her about the earthquake. She has not heard the news. Someday we'll go to Armenia, she says. It sounds like half question, half statement, so I say, yes, even though I don't believe her. As we leave the restaurant, a juggler swoops over, grinning. His hands seem barely to move, but his blue, yellow, and red clubs hurtle high above his head. He catches two in one hand and one in the other and bows deep. My mother claps. Yasmin and I, always tentative around strangers, consider the cracks in the paving stones. My mother presses a few gold and silver thousand lira coins into the juggler's hand. She also gives one each to Yasmin and me to toss into the Fontana de Quattro Fiumi. I tell my mother what my father told me about the fountain, about how the four figures in it are the gods of four rivers on four continents, the Nile, the Ganges, the Danube, and the Rio de la Plata. 
Above the gods is an obelisk topped with a dove. The obelisk represents the Catholic church. The river gods are powerful, but they prostrate themselves to the Vatican. The fountain is a symbol of colonialism, I whisper, echoing my father, who speaks to me like I'm, I'm a grown up. Colonialism, as I understand it, is white people stealing land from black and brown people, white people beating and killing black and brown people, white people forcing black and brown people into slavery and servitude. My father, I know, was born in the last year of colonial rule in what was then the Gold Coast. He says being born as Ghana was being born was the beginning of his good fortune, of our good fortune. I like that my mother laughs and tells me I'm smart. When I throw my coin into the water, I close my eyes tight and listen to my mother's laughter sing with the sound of water. That sound is the wish I dare not shape into words because words can be misconstrued. Later, I watch my mother get into the blue Fiat. Her husband starts the ignition. To see her more clearly, I squint. She rests her head against the window and I imagine or perhaps hope she is crying. The car pulls away absorbed by the night. I sniff the air for exhaust or perfume for any remnant of my mother's presence, but I smell only wet limestone and garlic. My stepmother Annabelle is cooking dinner. Piazza Navona seems far away now. We live in Eur, a neighborhood known by the acronym for the Esposizione Universale di Roma, a world's fair that never happened because of the onset of World War II. Eur was built by Mussolini to celebrate 20 years of fascist Italy and to expand the city to the sea. Unlike the rest of Rome, Eur is an orderly place. Its buildings are solid, polished white, and arranged around a grid of right angles. Usually its predictability makes me feel safe, but now it feels inhospitable, spiritless. Somewhere in the house, my sister shrieks. She does not want to take a bath. Her anger I know is about something else entirely. With a last breath, I inhale whatever particles of my mother remain and close the door behind me. In the hallway, I remove my shoes. The marble floor is cold against my thin socks. Above me, the bulb my father keeps forgetting to change flickers from light to dark, then light again. Between my thumb and fingers is the Polaroid my father took of my mother, Yasmin, and me minutes ago. All of us blinked. Later, I knock on my father and Annabelle's cracked open door and enter, trying to work, walk normally, resisting running into my father's arms. My lips quiver and I purse them to keep from crying as my father pulls me into a long hug. My head on his shoulder, I nuzzle into the soapy smell of his neck. He holds me like this every night until we vibrate to the same rhythm. Our heartbeats say, he is mine and I am his. He kisses my forehead and reminds me to dream sweet dreams, reminds me that tomorrow will be ours. We can read together all day and maybe in the evening we will listen to high life music and dance in our pajamas. These reminders I know are meant as consolation. He wants me to forget my mother was here. The following week, I take the caricature by the artist in Piazza Navona and the Polaroid picture of my mother, Yasmin, and me to school for show and tell. I do not tell my father. I attend an international school on Via Cassia. My classmates are from all over the world, but I am one of only two black students. Sarah Brennan, an English girl with green eyes, wants to know why my mother and I are different colors. There's no malice, only curiosity in her voice, but I feel embarrassed. I can only say that I don't know why. As I return to my seat, my face burns. At lunchtime, Miss Rossi, my teacher, sits next to me and asks if I enjoyed spending time with my mother. Tears pool in my eyes as I nod. She takes me by the hand and leads me into the bathroom where she helps me wash my face. She asks what is wrong. How do I tell her about the trembling that leads to ripping, then to violent rupture, to whole lives and whole cities disintegrating, to piles and piles of rubble, to displacement and exile. How do I tell her that a day that begins with pancakes for breakfast can end in disaster, that in an instant, an earthquake or a mother can arrive and change everything? How do I tell her that even when the earth stops shaking, cracks in the surface spread silently, pent up for forces of danger and chaos can be unleashed at any time? I don't know how to explain any of this. So I tell her that I am afraid of the aftershocks. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That was, was amazing. Um, everyone show some love for 
for Nadia that work. That was, that was so cool. I was just like taken away. I think the combination, the, the something about the combination of the, the food and the smells and how physical and visceral it was in combined with like all the, the, the amazing thoughts. Like it just had such a child, like you captured this energy of childhood. So, so wonderfully a day that begins with so much. But as the, as the aftershocks, that's really, really cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, show, show Nadia some, some love in the, in the chats there. Um, I'm going to put up, so aftershocks, uh, is not available till next year, but you can find Nadia on Twitter now. So um, find her there, keep the conversation going, uh, connect with her um, and keep keep up to date on, on all of her publishing information. That's really, really cool. I'm so excited to read more. Um, cool, all right, well, moving, moving right along. Um, our next reader is Emily Rabatel. Emily is the author of the critically acclaimed novel, The Professor's Daughter and a work of creative nonfiction, Searching for Zion, named a best book of 2013 by the Huffington Post and the San Francisco Chronicle, a finalist for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, grand prize winner of the New York Book Festival, and winner of a 2014 American Book Award. Her fiction and essays have been widely published and anthologized in Best American Short Stories, The New York Times, The New Yorker, Tin House, BuzzFeed, Literary Hub, The Guardian, Guernica, VQR, The Believer, Galan and elsewhere. And her honors include a Pushcart Prize, Chicago Tribune's Nelson Al Green Award, and fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York Foundation for the Arts, the Lenan Foundation, and the McDowell Colony. Emily also teaches creative writing at the City College of New York in Harlem, and she is joining us from uptown in New York City. Hello, Emily, welcome. Hi, Brian, thanks for having me. Yeah, Nadia, you got yeah. it, you, you got the mic. Major. Your book, Nadia, um, and I look forward to Shayla's book when it comes out next month, the end of this month. Um, so I'm just gonna read the first part of an essay that I wrote. Um, I was asked to write this by Jasmine Ward when she uh, took it upon herself to, to gather some black writers um, to write about police brutality. Um, after Trayvon Martin's death for uh, an anthology called The Fire this time. So yeah, I wrote this when my kids were two and four, they're now five and no, they were two and four when I wrote this and they're now seven and nine, but it's still the same moment. So I'm gonna read um, the first part of this essay. It's called Know Your Rights. On the Saturday after the Charleston church massacre, wherein nine worshipers at one of the nation's oldest black churches were slaughtered during Bible study by a white gunman hoping to ignite a race war, we dragged our kids to the east side to walk them over New York City's oldest standing bridge. It seemed as good a way as any to kill a weekend afternoon. The high bridge, which was built with much fanfare in the mid 19th century, as part of the Croton aqueduct system and as a promenade connecting upper Manhattan to the Bronx over the Harlem River had recently and somewhat miraculously reopened after 40 odd years of disuse. I say miraculously because the bridge was an infrastructure most of us had come to accept as blighted, even as some civic groups had coalesced to resurrect it. In the back of our minds that summer of 2015, as an uprising and its violent suppression raged in Missouri was the problem of when and how to talk to our black children about protecting themselves from the police. At what age is such a conversation appropriate? By what age is it critical? How could it not be despairing? And what precisely should be said? The boy was four then, the girl just two. The day was hot. En route to the bridge, we felt no reprieve from the sun, just as we'd felt no relief from the pileup of bad news about blacks being murdered with impunity. When we learned of the terror at AME Emanuel in Charleston, we had not yet recovered from the unlawful death of Freddie Gray in Baltimore, or the shooting of Mike Brown in Ferguson, or the chokehold death of Eric Garner in Staten Island, or the shooting of Trayvon Martin in Florida, or the shooting of Tamir Rice in Cleveland, 
to name but a few triggers of civil unrest. We weren't surprised there were no indictments in these cases, sadly enough, but we were righteously indignant. The deaths seemed to be cascading in rapid succession, each one tripping a live wire like the feet of Edward Moybridge's galloping horses. The picture we were getting, and not because it was growing worse, but because our technology now exposed it, was clear and mounting evidence of discriminatory systems that don't treat or protect our citizens equally. And escalating dissent was giving rise to a movement that insists what should be evident to everyone, Black Lives Matter. There were hashtag alerts for pop-up protests in malls, die-ins on roads, and other staged acts of civil disobedience, such as disruptions of white people eating their brunch. Protesters against police brutality dusted off some slogans from the civil rights era, such as, no justice, no peace. But others were au courant, I can't breathe, hands up, don't shoot, white silence is violence, and most poignant to me as a mother is my son next. It's too hot and my legs are too small, our son protested on the way to the bridge. The boy was right, it was hot and getting hotter. He was tall for four, but still so little. When standing in our front door, his nose just cleared the height of the doorknob. He was the same size as the pair of boys depicted in a two panel cartoon by Ben Sargent circulating widely on my Facebook feed that summer. Both panels depict a little boy at the threshold on the verge of stepping outdoors. The drawings are nearly identical, except that the first boy is white and the second black. I'm going out, mom, each boy calls to a mother outside the frame. The white boy's mother simply replies, put on your jacket. But the other mother's instructions comprise so intricate, leery, and vexed a warning that her words obstruct the exit. Put on your jacket, keep your hands in sight at all times, don't make any sudden moves, keep your mouth shut around police, don't run, don't wear a hoodie, don't give them an excuse to hurt you. And so on, until the text in her speech bubble blurs as in a painting by Glenn Ligon. The cartoon is titled, Still Two Americas. I didn't wish to be her, the mother who needed to say, some people will read you as black and therefore X. Why should I be the fearful mother? Nor did I covet the white mother's casual regard. I wanted to be the mother who got to say to her children, keep your eyes open for interesting details and take notes, as well as enjoy yourselves on their way out the door. But for now, I carried our sweaty girl down 173rd Street on my back while my husband led our stubborn son by the hand. You know the thermometer's popping in Washington Heights when there aren't any Dominicans out on the sidewalks playing dominoes. Nobody had yet cranked open the fire hydrants. The heat knocked out the girl as if it were a club. The boy was in a rotten mood. He demanded a drink, then rejected the water we packed. He whined that the walk was too long and then challenged our authority in a dozen other hectoring ways until we at last arrived at Highbridge Park. Then he refused to descend the hundred stairs to the bridge by flinging himself onto the asphalt with his arms and legs bent in the style of a swastika, not five feet from a dead rat. The kid's defiance bothered us for all the usual reasons a parent should find it irksome, but also because it allo it's allowed to incubate in the ghetto where we live that defiance could get him killed. Our son was soon coaxed down the vertiginous stairs by the magical horn of an Amtrak train on the railway beneath the bridge. He has explained to me his fierce attraction to trains and boats and vehicles in general with irritation that I didn't already know the answer. They take you somewhere else. That's just it. From the time your children begin walking, they are moving away from you. That is as it should be even when you can't protect them from harm with anything but the inadequate outerwear of your love. A sweet old man in seersucker shorts stopped us at the entrance to the bridge to make sure we appreciated the marvel of its rehabilitation. He was something of a history buff and spoke with a European accent, Greek, I think. He could recall when the bridge was shut down after falling into long decline and the time before that when miscreants and vandals toss projectiles over the guardrail into the polluted water below or at the traffic on the Harlem River Drive. Thanks to him, I know that the bridge was a feat of engineering, originally modeled after a Roman aqueduct, siphoning water 
from Westchester County through pipes beneath its walkway into the city, enabling New Yorkers to enjoy their first indoor plumbing, including the flush toilet. The old man never thought he'd live to see the day when the High Ridge was back in business and was proud that the citizen-led campaign to reopen it had succeeded. This bridge changed everything, the old man said in wonderment as if the relic was a truer pian to empire than the skyscrapers twinkling in the skyline far to the south of us, the Chrysler Building, the former city core tower, and the spire of the Empire State. Dutifully, we paraded it across to the Bronx. Maybe it was because I so admired the old man's perspective, attuned as it was to a less conspicuous wonder of the world, that on our return trip home, I noticed a mural I could have sworn had not been there before. Know your rights, the mural trumpeted in capital letters. How had it escaped my attention? The artwork covered a brick wall abutting the 24-hour laundromat I passed every weekday morning on the walk to the children's daycare. A vision of tropical blues that splashed out from the gritty gray surroundings, creating an illusion of depth. My eyes drank it in. This mural operates like a comic strip and panels marrying image and text. In the first panel, a youngster is carded by a law enforcement official. In the second, a goateed man in a baseball cap is being handcuffed. In the third, a group of citizens stare evenly outward. One of them wears a look of disgust and a t-shirt that says Fourth Amendment, a sly allusion to the part of our constitution that protects us against unreasonable search and seizure without probable cause. Another holds his cell phone aloft to record what is happening on the street. You have the right to film and observe police activity, the mural states in Spanish, appropriate for a neighborhood where Spanish is the dominant language and where young men of color are regularly stopped and frisked by the police. In the lower left-hand corner, the Miranda rights are paraphrased in English. My first instinct was to take a picture of the mural so that I could carry it with me in my pocket. I was grateful for it, not only as a thing of beauty on the gallery of the street, but also as a kind of answer to the question that had been troubling us, how to inform our children about the harassment they might face. The mural struck me as an act of love for the people who would pass it by. I understood why it had been made and why it had been made here in the hood next to a laundromat, as opposed to on Fifth Avenue, next to Tiffany's or Saks. It was armor against the cruelty of the world. It was also a salve to reclaim physical and psychic space. I wondered who had done it. After some internet sleuthing, I discovered the painter was a Chilean artist who goes by the tag name Sekis, and that this mural was the first of several public artworks commissioned by a coalition of grassroots organizations called People's Justice for Community Control and Police Accountability. The other Know Your Rights murals were spread out across four of New York City's five boroughs, excluding Staten Island, where a great number of cops live in poor neighborhoods most plagued by police misconduct. For the rest of that summer and into the fall, I photographed as many of them as I could, like a magpie collecting bright things for her nest. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much. Wow, that was amazing. Everyone, please, Show Emily some love in the chat. That was that was very cool. Um, and also like um, almost as if you planned how it paired with Nadia's to go from a child's perspective to a parent's perspective. Um, super, super cool. Thank you so much. Um, I um, I'm gonna share up here so I have a, the antibody has a relationship with our local indie bookstore, uh, Greenlight Books, and um, you can pick up, um, order through Greenlight, um, copy of Emily's books, um, The Professor's Daughter, um, and or Searching for Zion. Um, if you follow that, that link there, that takes you to the reading series um, as a page. I'm also putting up Emily's uh, Twitter handle. Um, Emily is, a, is, I think, a, a must follow on Twitter. Um, if, uh, I find so many um, wonderful and um, 
sometimes scary and thought provoking pieces on the climate crisis that our planet is going through um, from Emily Speed. So thank you also, Emily, for, for, for doing that and sharing those. Um, very cool. All right. Moving right along, our final reader for the evening is Shayla Lawson. Um, Shayla is the author of three books of poetry, A Speed Education in Human Being, the chapbook Pantone, and I Think I'm Ready to See Frank Ocean. She was born in Rochester, Minnesota, grew up in Lexington, Kentucky, studied architecture in Italy, and spent a few years as a Dutch housewife, milk, maid, braids, and all. She teaches at Amherst College and lives in Brooklyn, New York, where she's joining us. She's out at the end of the month. Please get those uh, fingers tapping and keys clacking and welcome Shayla Lawson. Hi, Shayla. Hi, how are you doing? Can everybody hear me? Are we good? Ah, there we are. Okay. Um, this is my book. This is major. One thing that I would like to say before I begin, um, in terms of bookstores to look for my book, um, I would check out Cafe Con Libros, um, which is both Black and Latinx owned and a queer feminist bookstore. Uh, personally, as a shopper um, and as a Black woman, I've been treated horribly by Greenlight Books. And do not, I, I actually refused to have my reading there when I was asked by HarperCollins and have uh, continued to make this, you know, this information public. Um, I have been both belittled and followed uh, in my neighborhood, uh, in my neighborhood uh, edition of Greenlight Bookstore. And I've had friends who have worked at Greenlight Bookstore as black people um, and have been treated incredibly badly. So it is not a place that I would necessarily encourage patronage in this time of everybody jumping on the bandwagon of, uh, you know, liking to say that they are, you know, for the cause and for the idea of liberation. There's a lot of people that have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of people that are continuing to perpetuate the idea that they are safe when we know that that is not the way that we've been treated a couple of days ago. So it's gonna take a whole lot more than just everybody turning around uh, and turning their feeds and coming outside with picket signs uh, before I feel that we are anywhere close to having the dialogue that we need to about what the world is at this point. And I'm excited that there are a lot of people that are getting the opportunity to have their say, um, but it's been a long time coming. Um, and I'm, trying to maintain optimism because I recognize that pessimism is a tool of patriarchy. To believe that there's nothing that we individually can do um, is one of the tools that's been used against us. It's one of the tools that's kept us from organizing. It's one of the mechanisms that's kept us from thinking that um, speaking out does any good. And I, for one, you know, a lot of the reason why I wrote this book was because of how often I saw Black women underestimated. I mean, you know, to look at the specifics of what happened to me with Greenlight Bookstore. It was the day that Toni Morrison died. And the only thing that I wanted to do was drape myself in a copy of Toni's words. So I'm walking around my neighborhood. I go into the bookstore um, and I have two different books. One, I have one bookstore person follow me. And then I had the other one tell me that where I was looking for the book wasn't right. And I just left with more of a feeling of anxiousness and anxiety and sadness than I had anticipated when bookstores, when books are a place that's always been safe for me. I started writing books because it was a place where I could go and people couldn't hurt me. And bookstores should offer that to their clientele. And I really hope that um, in the process of supporting events like this, that bookstores, bookstore owners and uh, bookstore, you know, members of the community, the people who work there, um, really think about what it means to support the work of, uh, of artists of color and what it means when you see faces like ours come into a store, because just because you didn't know that I was a writer whose book you will now be trying to sell in my store doesn't mean that I should have been treated any differently. So I'm gonna read a few excerpts from the final essay in my book. It's called Young Drifted in Black. And it's dedicated to Nina Simone. First time I heard Nina Simone, I was young, gifted, and Black. 
I'm in the driver's seat of my car playing To Be Young, Gifted, and Black on CD the summer after I graduated from college. Windows open. Nina plays emphatic chords while a fast wind in the speaker spatters the belted notes into vibrato. Nina Simone records and releases the song after Lorraine Hansberry loses her life with cancer in 1965 at the age of 34. In honor of Hansberry's posthumously published memoir and theatrical work by the same name, I carried a well-loved edition of To Be Young, Gifted, and Black inside me as a teen, long after I'd returned it back to the public library. As an adult, I'd comb through Lorraine Hansberry's collected papers at the Schomburg Center in Harlem, looking for anything I could that told me what these women talked about together. During Lorraine's last days in the hospital, Nina sent her a greeting card with a printed message, why wouldn't you be sick? Middle class mediocrity everywhere, songs crying out unsung, your untimely genius, locked in, choked by a faceless city, blanketed in quiet fury. Leave it to Nina, I said to myself, pulling Nina's greeting card from the library's collection of Lorraine's personal letters. Leave it to Nina to be the friend who sends you the card that cries out, this silence cannot appreciate you. The character on the front has tears in her eyes. She holds a coffee mug and a cigarette. I can see how Nina saw this card and thought of Lorraine. Nina must have thought of Lorraine all the time. Sitting amidst cozy hardwood bookshelves and in front of a stack of archival papers, I read a Nina Simone interview by 17 magazine journalists. Nina's first question, are you gonna write something about me in 17 magazine? A reasonable question. But the interviewer says, she comes on strong and direct. The interviewer goes on to describe Nina as intense and alternately attractive and homely, depending on what angle she's sitting at. Unlike the other interviews I studied in the 17 archives, Sade, Diana Ross, Nina Simone appears to be the only singer for whom the interviewer seems at a loss. Compelled by this silence that does not appreciate her, Nina asks her own follow-up question. Why does it take so long for someone with a little talent to gain some success? The question is never answered. Aside from a few notes, the rest of the page is blank. I try to figure out why Nina's interview is never finished. A librarian and I search the archive folders, checking to see if a second page was misplaced. We never find it. It is weeks later when I am going through my notes alone on New Year's Eve, finding the dark and its advent a perfectly good time to write a riff on my favorite misconstrued singer. That I realize the 17 Magazine interview of Nina Simone was conducted on the day Lorraine Hansberry died. I sat in front of my laptop and coffee mug and cried. All Nina wanted to be when she was young was the world's greatest black concert pianist. To be surrounded, I believe, by black genius. To shake the bedrock of who was major, a major key. I think about the alternately attractive and homely angles the interviewer commented upon in Nina's face, blanketed in quiet fury how unconcerned Nina was about being formidable. Both Nina and Lorraine had more than a little talent. This is what made them intimidating, especially to the white establishment. Much of Lorraine's redacted FBI case file details the transition of to be young, gifted, and black from a Broadway play to a TV movie. Because Nina wrote Lorraine an anthem, Nina was in the case file. Yes, the FBI has monitored and critiqued the work of talented black writers for generations. As you listen to this, consider yourself party to a grand conspiracy. Hearing Nina sing to be young, gifted and black for the first time, I wrestled with the words. 
I didn't believe it was all right for a black girl to love herself enough to say it out loud. It is a gift to be inimitable. I am 18 when I listen to the song in my car and I turn it off, still not ready to love me yet. When I slow beside another vehicle at a stoplight, I hear Nina saying that I am brilliant and better and I turn the volume way down, roll the windows up to half mast. I grip both hands on the steering wheel as if co-signing a pact of war against my hometown, against my country, against my own survival. It is dangerous to be young, black, and gifted. It is dangerous to be an instrument of light. First time I heard Nina Simone, I was four women. I was in the hallways of my high school spitting a Lauren Hill verse, a metaphor. Defecation, the vehicle. Nina Simone, it's tenor. But I didn't know who Nina was. I'd gloss over her name every time the Fuji's Ready or Not track played, making up the words, determining my own meaning. Then one day, Khadija stopped me. What did you say? I mumbled something indecipherable. Nina Simone, that's what it says, she tells me sweetly condescending. I put a Nina Simone disc in my monthly order of BGM or BMG Club's music CDs. When it arrives, Four Women is the first song I listen to. In 1963, when Nina Simone first heard that four little girls had died in the bombing of a Birmingham church, instead of taking to the streets, she took to her garage and built a zip gun. I am not unfamiliar with the spirit that brings a woman to a gun. One of the stories I always return to about the women in my family is that my great grandmother shot her husband in the foot and ran off, leaving him behind and their seven or eight children. She sounds like a verse in a Nina Simone song. I had it in my mind to go out and kill someone, recalls Simone referring to the murders in her autobiography, I put a spell on you. It was only when Nina's then husband and manager convinced Nina to come out of the garage, reminding her that her best means of intervention had always been her music, that she went to her piano and composed Mississippi Goddamn, her first protest song. What I take from both of these black women is that our collective survival depends on self-preservation. Although my grandmother, my great grandmother was inspired to use a gun because of domestic violence and not domestic terrorism, the instinct feels the same. Black women have battled against backbreaking labor and brute force, against bombs and abuse, subjugation and silence to ensure the next of us women survives. It is not a pleasant narrative. My family rarely talks about the event that led to my great-grandmother abandoning all her offspring, including my grandmother. She returned years later to retrieve her children, but by that time, many of the boys had grown into men, and my grandmother, the only girl, was a mother with kids of her own. I have one other story of my great-grandmother. My grandmother is in her early 20s and the man she is dating threatens to beat her in front of her young mother, of my young mother, aunt and uncle. The children run across the street to get their grandma and the house she now lives. She follows them back to their house, brandishing a heavy cast iron skillet. The man's back is turned to her as she, his, he lifts his fist to hit my grandmother. If you hit her, my great grandmother says, imagine what I will do to you with this. The violence that erupted from these women is provocation and necessity. Had Nina Simone taken to the streets with a gun that day, we would have lost her voice. God damn, to think of my life without Nina singing in it, singing into it. I cannot imagine the kind of woman I would have become without either Nina or my great grandmother. 
I have always been a woman on the verge of a gun. My anger is quiet, reserved, but I feel so close to the edge of a trigger I can feel the metal cool and codify in my hand. I grip a pen instead of a song or a skillet or a trigger. I do not consider this strategy for assassination a passive action. It is hard to tell the story of who black girls are without a hidden massacre. The dark is our beauty, but it is also the lot to which we have been cast. To the shadows, to the margins, to the places most people shield their eyes because they do not want to see. And for women, we are a field worker, a sex worker, the child of rape, and we are also murderously angry. It is to the shame of humanity and not our bodies that we have been these things. I have seen four women examined as the reclamation of the lives of the little girls killed in Alabama that day. But it isn't an interpretation I agree with. Nor do I see Nina displaying the opposing strategies of African Americans based on their hair textures and complexions, the song ending in the voice of the bitter and brown Nina herself. For me, the four women are all Nina Simone the conjoined creation of one Eunice Kathleen Wayman, the woman who became the singer, the activist, and the pseudonym, the young black girl from North Carolina who dreamed of becoming a concert pianist. Instead, she surrounded us in genius. She made us a history. She wrote herself into who we are. In the second to last set of verses of four women, the song points a gun at the past the final narrator telling us her bitterness stems from being the descendant of slaves. What do they call me? Nina asks. Her piano makes a ground tremble with dramatic tension. She answers, gathering her girls together in the plurality of one name. Peaches, a metaphor, the fruit, the vehicle, us, the tenor, the foliage wide, the blossoms fragrant. We, the tart, taut, and petulant. We, the sweetly gnarled fallen fruit to the bed grass, nestling in the ground to begin anew. We have survived the hostile soil, our hard pit, our ripe flesh. Our tree feeds the world, some of us given, some of us ripped from us, some of us still unfurling but we keep the orchard alive. We keep us alive. I write to you nestled under our dark canopy. I hear you pressing my cheek to the stiff dark bark. I hear you, my skin is. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shayla. Thank you so much. Everyone show, show Shayla some love. That was absolutely riveting. Um, amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Wow. And, and thank you so much too, for just sharing your, 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 for your honesty and, and sharing your experiences with green light. I have, um, it's eye opening. So, um, thank you. I appreciate you, um, telling us, uh, I don't know, spreading, spreading the word about that. I'm going to show everybody here. I got a link to Cafe Con Libros in Brooklyn. Um, Shayla's uh, collection is coming out June 30th. Is that right? Correct. So a couple yeah. Of weeks. Awesome. So, um, so please, you know, order it from, from Cafe Con Libros. Um, and I'm also going to share your Twitter handle as well. Um, blue if I wasn't you can find Shayla there sharing some um, I've been really impressed with your graphic work that you've been putting up too. like the 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 images and all that is super cool not bad for a former architect and designer <laughs> amazing amazing and it's just so it's so as I love when people have so many so many different uh, facets to their talent um, and also like here's a reading too I mean talking about your grandmother again like we had a whole generational kind of kind of theme to the evening um and i want to make some space for the audience to ask some 
some questions. So if you have questions for the authors, please use the chat here to, to type them in. Please um, ask these, these three, three brilliant authors um, some questions. But I, I actually, I have a question, um, Sheila, specifically for you, because thinking um, you wrote three books of poetry before, where have you always been writing essays or was it a like a, a decision that you made at some point to like put poetry aside for a little bit and focus on essays? Well, I think most of the poems, when, you know, was I writing poems? I write a lot of, I write a lot of prose, even as a poet. Uh, so Pantone was a whole book I did of prose poems, um, did, you know, related to the Pantone color system. Uh, my, uh, I think I'm ready to see Frank Ocean has a lyric essay in it that was published in Salon, um, just, you know, as an essay. So it's definitely always been a thread within my writing. I really like making scenes. Um, and I like with poetry that there's a real um, metric intention, which I think sometimes is missing in prose. So as a field of study, me learning to write poetry was probably the strongest place for me to understand what I wanted to do with prose. Um, and prose for me is just an expansion of a poetic story. I'm actually going through, I wrote a book of visual poems and right now I'm going through and I'm rewriting it as prose uh, because I was like, well, what, you know, what happens if this is a romantic novel that also has a poetry collection as an attachment to it? So I like that idea of the expansion and contraction that comes from playing with the different forms. That's really cool. Is that something Nadia or and or Emily? Is that is that anything that resonates with you as well? I mean, do you do you, I mean Emily? You've written a novel now. You're it seems at least from what you've published most recently that it's been in nonfiction. I mean, do you do you kind of move through genre based on how you're feeling, or is it something that you kind of put put fiction aside and focus just on on nonfiction for a while? Yeah, um, lately I'd say for, for me, nonfiction seems like required. Um, I've been writing about the intersection of climate, the climate crisis and, and environmental justice for a couple of years. And um, it, it just doesn't feel like fiction is the right tool to do that with. I, I miss fiction, but I, it, 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 things feel so, uh, there's so many multiple crises coalescing right now that it, it feels, um, I feel compelled to write nonfiction. Hmm. Nadia, is that, is that? Yeah, I mean, I, so, you know, I have a lyric essay chapbook out um, and I definitely think a lot um, like Shayla, I really, I read a lot of poetry and I do write a lot of poetry too. I haven't published any of it, but it is a form that I really love because of the discipline around language and sound. And I care a lot about sound in my prose as well. Um, and so I, I definitely think about that. Um, and I think in terms of genre, I often don't know what genre I'm writing in when I start. Um, and so uh, usually I'm exploring a question um, that I'm sort of wrestling with and I just allow myself to kind of enter the question and try and wrestle with what um, emerges from it. And like Emily, a lot of what I have been writing lately has been in the essay form because I feel like that is really lending itself to the urgency of sort of getting to the root of some of the questions that I'm holding. Um, and I, I am also writing a novel, but the like scenes keep turning into essays. So it might take a very long time to get there. <laughs> I love it. Or maybe it's a novel in, in essays. Um, <laughs> a question from, from the audience and, and I'm mindful of your time. So I'll just take a couple. Um, so Kimberly Fain has a great question. Before settling down to write, do you have any sort of a comforting ritual? Um, that you do before before you begin. Anyone who who wants it? I know, I feel like there's a there's a before time and an after time. <laughs> um, this is a time where it feels really imperative to write, uh, 
and it's also very hard for me to focus. And I have found um, in the company of other black women, um, I just met last night with a group of black women who, who needed, especially after the last couple of weeks, just to come together in solidarity, even for just an hour to say intentionally what we needed to work on. Um, and just to, to have each other to be accountable to and in and, and support of, it felt like um, crucial to have a sisterhood to be working among. And um, I feel like that's probably always, always a good idea to have a sisterhood <laughs> that you're writing among, but um, right now it feels absolutely necessary actually. Is it um, Shayla, Nadia, any any response to that or to or to just even the general idea of having a comforting ritual? Shayla, you want it? Sure. Um, I I think one of the things that I've learned as someone who writes in, a, in different genres is that different things want to be written different times of day. Um, so I definitely listen for when different projects what time of day works for them as opposed to getting frustrated by the fact that I'm writing time and the thing that I want to write is not happening in that writing time. So it's kind of delighted me to realize that different things um, require different places for me to write them. And often that means, you know, different costumes as well. So, you know, especially with COVID and the fact that I don't have to necessarily be on the same kind of bedtime that I had to before, you know, as a teacher. Um, you know, getting up really late at night or really early in the morning and writing in silk pajamas has become one of my favorite forms of self-care. <laughs> so that's been enjoyable. I love it. I love, I feel like my best work is done in pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> it encourages the dreams to just yeah. kind of keep, keep flowing. <laughs> yeah. Nadia, how about you? Yeah, I would definitely agree with the pajamas. I'm very much enjoying living my life in pajamas right now. Never um, <laughs> and then coming back to the poetry, I actually, I've been reading June Jordan's um, collected love poems. And so before I sit down to write, I've just been sitting with some of her poems. Um, and I find that, you know, to go back to Emily's point about sisterhood, like I just feel, find something very comforting in sort of nestling into the words of another black woman. Um, before sitting down to write in my pajamas. <laughs> that sounds so, so much healthier too as a creative space than say logging on to social media before sitting down to write, which can, which can, can really affect, <laughs> can affect the mood. Um, final question here from Deanna. This is a great question. What are you reading right now that you find really moving uh, or is informing your current work? Um, Nadia, I guess you mentioned already the, the the poems. Do you have any anything else that's that that you're that you're reading right now or, or turning to? Um, I'm I'm reading a lot of Black women poets actually. Um, in addition to reading June Jordan's collected, um, I just finished Sophia Sinclair's collection that I really loved. Um, so yeah, I've been kind of coming to the poets and and specifically Black women. Very cool. Emily, how about you? Um, I, I just read and found it really uh, the right time to read it, a uh, um, diary by Anonymous called A Woman in Berlin that was written um, by an anonymous woman in um, Berlin in 1945. And uh, in, in, in the spring where the city was under siege by the Red Army and she and many other women in the city um, were repeatedly raped. But she's writing it um, in a time of crisis, you know, like I appreciated her that she her only task for the diary was just to record the events of her day. She didn't have the insight of time yet, like the hindsight yet to, to be able to analyze what was happening. And so all she's doing is taking notes. And I found for myself as a writer and 
as a, as a writer with very limited writing time because I'm parenting children and homeschooling them during this pandemic and because events are coming so swiftly um, and so dramatically. Um, I, I value reading that book because it's taught me, you know, I, I don't need to interpret this moment for anybody else. I don't need to do that work for anybody else. All I need to do um, on a daily basis for myself is record what I'm witnessing and feeling, what my children are saying, um, what's happening to us. And later I can mold that maybe into art. But I found that diet, like, you know, just the, the record of a diary to be really, a diary during a crisis moment in history to be really instructive. Thank you. Sheila, what about you? Yeah. Right now I'm reading um, Angela Davis's Freedom is a Constant Struggle, which I, I find really inspiring and really helpful. It definitely encourage people in this time to go to it. Um, I had just finished Kathy Parkong's Minor Feelings, which I also thought uh, does a great job of uh, talking about the current moment um, from the perspective of a Korean American woman. Um, I've also been reading a lot of black speculative fiction. I mean, Octavia Butler is right about everything. So <laughs> it's a good time, to, it's seems like a good time to pull that down <laughs> on the shelf. And N.K. Jemison, a lot of other um, black, speculative female writing. That's very cool. Thank you guys so much. I guess before we go, do you have any questions for one another? I always forget to ask the readers that and nobody feel on the spot. It's totally cool. You you guys, this has just been, um, this has been, it's been a, a night of, 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 you know, it's just been, these readings have been powerful and and just beautiful, and so I so appreciate your your honesty and you taking the time too to come and and share your stories with us. Uh, this has been amazing. Um, thank you all. I saw there was one other question in there. I'm so sorry, um, but find all three of of these authors, Nadia, Emily, and Shayla, are out online on Twitter. Find them. Keep the conversation going. Um, to keep your eyes peeled. June 30th for This Is Major, Shayla Lawson's essay collection is out. Um, get a copy. Um, I know I will. It's uh, been really cool to hear. And I'm going to put up here um, the little plug for next week. If you want to come back, uh, June 16th, Roy Guzman, Genevieve Hudson, and Wyatt, two more. Uh, and I'm putting a little link there too as well to uh, if you want to see um, who's uh, coming down the line. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so much. And you can find this on um, the Lit Hub's uh, virtual book channel um, probably tomorrow. I'll share a link when it's out. Um, but yeah, thank you, Nadia, Nadia. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Shayla. Thank you, everyone in the audience for coming. Until next week, stay healthy, stay optimistic, and keep reading books. All right, have a good night, you guys. Bye. Thank you. I just wanted to take a minute to read through the chat because I couldn't do it all right. No, I never get a chance to uh, to see what everybody's uh...